What are the things that aren't sweet, like pasta or white bread? So starch is glucose. Glucose is not great. But compared to fructose, glucose is a walk in the park. Okay? Here's what happens with glucose. And I, again, I didn't do the biochemistry for very good reasons. When you consume glucose, whether it's bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, you know, anything white, except for sugar, 80% of that bolus goes to all the organs in your body because every organ in your body has a glucose transporter for glucose. 20% will hit your liver. Now that 20% will first replete glycogen. It goes straight to glycogen if you need glycogen repletion. That's why we have marathoning carb loaders. Those that, once your glycogen is replete, then the rest will get shuttled down to the mitochondria and will do the exact same thing that fructose does once it hits the mitochondria. So fructose will do it, but it's only 20% of the total and most of it went to glycogen. So the number of calories hitting the mitochondria is way lower than that of fructose, which all goes to the mitochondria and all in the liver. So it's a matter of scale. So is carbohydrate good? But is glucose better than fructose? Way. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, in your interview on Sunday, on 60 Minutes, you touched on uh, sugar being a, a fuel for cancer. I didn't touch on that. Actually, that was Luke Cantley from uh, the Brigham. Oh, I'm sorry. Then, I, don't know. I mean, I can try to answer the question for oh, you. I was just curious if that had, if that has always been the case with cancer, or is that somehow, has cancer adapted itself to... That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that question specifically. What I do know is that a lot of cancers are insulin sensitive. They have insulin receptors on them, and that forces glucose into them because they need glucose, because they're dividing like crazy. Mm -hmm. So they are insulin sensitive. You, the higher the insulin, the more they grow. That I know. And, and that has always been the case. And that, almost assuredly, that's always been the case. I, like I said, I, it, that is not my field per se, right. but it's almost assuredly true. What he didn't talk about was that some cancers may actually use fructose preferentially for growth, too. Mm -hmm. And that's a big issue. That's, still, that's being investigated. That's early. Yeah. There's a growing consciousness of stevia. What do you yeah. think about that? All right, so everybody wants to know about diet sweeteners, OK? Me too. I want to know about them too. That one though. On stevia. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, no, I'm going to, I'm, all right. Let me tell you about diet sweeteners in general, and then we'll talk about stevia in specific. Diet sweeteners are the big bugaboo, because no one knows what to do with them, and there's a reason, because we have no data. We have zero data. We have this thing called pharmacokinetics, and we have this thing called pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to a drug. Pharmacodynamics is what a drug does to your body. Not the same. We have all the pharmacokinetics for all the diet sweeteners because the FDA demands it. They won't release it to the public unless you do that. We have none of the pharmacodynamics for any of the diet sweeteners. None. Zero. Zilcho. Nada. Why? Because it can't help the food industry sell it. So we don't know what azosulfame K does to your ghrelin. We don't know what sucralose does to your leptin. We don't know what... Um, uh, uh, stevia does to your long-term food intake because those studies haven't been done and the NIH should do them but the NIH says well that's the food industry's job so we have an impasse no one's doing them we don't have the data they're allowed to market it anyway because the FDA says they're safe so I can't comment on any diet sweetener because the data doesn't exist now with respect to stevia specifically um, I have actually seen the pharmacokinetics up close and personal. And uh, of the diet sweeteners, it actually probably looks like the best one pharmacokinetically. But I refuse to endorse it until I know the pharmacodynamics. Does that help? Any others? Um, you said that the body uh, handles ethanol in much, much the same way as fructose. Is ethanol also correlated with um, all these uh, metabolic symptoms? Absolutely. Absolutely. What's interesting about ethanol is it has a J-shaped curve. So a little bit of alcohol is actually protective and actually makes you insulin sensitive. And one of the reasons is because it induces heat shock proteins, which help cells adapt to stress. 
at low dose. So low dose spirits, low dose wine, no problem. But high dose does everything that sugar does and all the all things in metabolic syndrome. What's interesting is that when you take alcohol and glucose and combine them, fat and carbohydrate, now there's no J-shaped curve, now it's all metabolic syndrome. Those are called beer and shochu, okay, which is the Japanese fermented beverage. And there, there is no J-shaped curve. It's basically dose response all the way to metabolic syndrome because it's fat and carbohydrate at the same time. So if you eat your fat, I'm sorry, if you drink your fat in a red wine, go for it. Okay, I'm gonna have some tonight. <laughs> okay, and don't you keep me away from it either. Um, but, but a beer is another story, okay? Um, there's a lot of products out right now, like coconut sugar, palm sugar. All garbage. Okay. <laughs> I know agave is all garbage. not all garbage. Agave is worse. Yeah, I know that's the worst. Because it's the highest in fructose. I haven't find much data on just palm sugar. And on this, they're, all they're all the same. Low glycemic. There are 48 names for sugar, and that's on purpose. Because the NLEA, that nutrition facts label, you have to list the ingredients by mass, in order of mass. So you can make um, one form of sugar, number five, and then a different one, number six, another one's number seven, number eight, number nine. When you add them up, they're number one. Okay? So the more different kinds of sugar that the food industry can put into any given product, the more they can deceive you. And don't tell me that that doesn't happen. I know it happens because my former clinic coordinator used to work in marketing for General Mills. And he sat in on those meetings. Where can we hide the sugar? That's why he went to medical school. He's good. You need to give him a job when he's done. His name's Frank Brody. He's fantastic. <laughs> yep. um, I am a former brand manager for a company that sells Crest Foods. Where I uh, worked on food pebbles, and I sat in focus groups where parents would say, I give my child pretty bubbles because, um, so what about giving them fruit first thing in the morning? Oh, right. That's a and, problem. You know, I have to say, as the parent of two young kids now, it's, it, it's an emotional point. It's, there's so much misinformation out there. Yep, there is. Um, and I guess I would just love to know, what are your top three resources for laymen? First of all, thank you for your, the comment and your honesty. And actually, I applaud you for having the courage to say it. Um, you ask a very good question. I mean, how do we get this information out there? Because there is so much misinformation, okay? Is juicing a fruit good or bad? You kill the fiber. Now, you don't kill the soluble fiber. You kill the insoluble fiber. So fiber is really important. I didn't talk about the biochemistry of fiber, but let's talk about that for a second. Okay. The insoluble fibers, the cellulose, you know, the stringy stuff like in the celery, okay, that acts as a lattice work. Everybody got a uh, hair catcher on your bathtub drain? Okay, right? So if the, if the hair catcher is clean and you run the water, does the water go down the drain? Sure, okay? If you don't have the hair catcher on, does the water go down the drain with the hair? Sure. If you have the hair catcher on and the hair is all over the hair catcher, does the water go down the drain? No, right? Everybody got that? So the insoluble fiber is like the hair catcher, it's this lattice work, and the soluble fiber is like the hair plugging up all the holes. So it, caught, it actually forms on electron microscopy like a gel that runs through your intestine and actually acts as a second barrier from the gut into the bloodstream to limit the rate of absorption and carries the food through the intestine faster to get to the satiety signal sooner. So even though you don't inject, absorb any of the fiber, it is absolutely essential for metabolic health. So when you juice a fruit, basically you're killing the fiber. Yet people would say that's fruit. No, it's not. It's been processed. Fruity Pebbles has been processed. Whole Grain Lucky Charms has been processed, processed, processed. Bottom line, how do we get people to eat real food again? Okay, now, Kraft is one of the 10 largest con food conglomerates in the country, along with Nestle, P&G, ConAgra, um, uh, PepsiCo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, how can they still make money selling real food? And uh, well, not right now, they're not. The point is they could and they, sh they need to. And the only way is with public opinion. 
when public opinion sways, when there are more votes than dollars, that's when things will change. So it's everyone's job to get this out. Why do you think I do public media? You think I like it? <laughs> you know, I don't want to be on 60 Minutes. I mean, I want this whole thing to go away. I never want to see another obese kid as long as I live. You know, but what are you going to do? So I do my job, okay? And you know what? You do yours. Okay, you're a parent. You do yours. And tell your friends. And then they'll tell their friends. And that's how we'll get this done. So are there resources that you would recommend people reference or look to? It's, you know, the problem is that all the references are co-opted as well, especially the ones from the industry. Um, and the science is complicated at best, you know, and impossible at worst. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. You know, when it's out, hopefully that will serve as a good resource because it's all science in digestible fashion, you know, um, with some fiber. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, I, I don't know of any sort of one book to sort of take away. Um, there is a book that just came out recently that maybe would be close. It's not really, you know, it doesn't have the, the meat of it, but um, Mark Hyman's The Blood Sugar Solution at least has the, um, the, the appearance of you know, going in the right direction. And his uh, final mantra is the same as mine, eat real food. So, and you know, he doesn't give the science for why, but he, you know, he at least you know, says the right thing. So we have time for perhaps one more question? Yeah, please. This is a little off the topic, but are, are you aware of any studies showing the effect of high soda consumption on kidneys? Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's not good. It is not good. First of all, it causes hypertension through the uric acid pathway. And uh, it's, uh, it causes chronic uh, renal failure long t over long term. This is work from uh, Lozada Sanchez and Rick Johnson. And uh, oh, it actually goes back quite a ways. The uh, nephrologists are actually very interested in this. Um, you know, we've known for years that fructose causes gout. Um, you know, and, and that's because it makes uric acid. And uric acid it interferes with endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which is the, uh, makes nitric oxide, which is your endogenous blood pressure lower. And when it does that in the kidney, it actually blows out your kidney. And it's one of the reasons that the obese are, have such chronic renal failure. Absolutely. Great, well thank you so much, a wonderfully Thank you for coming.